All right, so this chapter is just a catch-up lecture on some of the circular motion stuff that we uh, missed in previous chapters, and we waited till now to go over it, because uh, we're about to get into the rotation chapter. So we're going to look at uniform circular motion before we do that. Okay, so uniform circular motion um, is essentially uh, two things. First of all, the speed of the, of the particle is constant. And notice it says speed, not velocity. Um, and then also a particle travels around in a circle or an arc. So that's sort of where the uniform uh, bit of this pops in. Oops, let's go back. Um, so you have a constant speed and you're going in a circle, right? So you are accelerating because you're changing direction, but you're not changing the value or the magnitude of the, of the speed or the, the magnitude of the velocity. Okay. All right, so um, as the direction of the velocity of the particle changes, there is going to be acceleration, right? So it, even if the speed stays the same. What we call this in circular motion is called centripetal acceleration, right? And centripetal means center seeking, right? So if you notice the circle down here, we have an object, or objects in this case, an object in circular motion. The acceleration is always going to be directed towards the center of the circle because it's constantly changing direction. At any point on the circle, the velocity of this object is going to be tangent to the circle. Right? So the velocity is going to be in this direction, but what keeps it turning is this acceleration, right? acting towards the center. And of course, with an acceleration, there must be a force. And in a couple slides, we'll look at what that force is. Um, so here it shows that V is the, uh, the speed of the particle, and R is going to be the radius. Right, so if you were to measure this distance here, that is going to be the radius. And the equation that relates everything together, right, so, so our centripetal acceleration, what we say is A sub C, or centripetal acceleration, is equal to V squared over R. So this is the centripetal acceleration is equal to the linear velocity at this point, so the magnitude of that velocity squared, divided by r, which is the radius of the circle. Now we also have another equation, which is velocity is equal to 2 pi r over t. So essentially what this is, is just our regular velocity equation, right? It's velocity is equal to x over t, or some distance over time. Well, the distance that it travels in one full circle around is simply going to be the circumference of that circle, right? So the circumference is, of course, 2 pi r, and it's over a capital T. Now, it's important that this is a capital T, because capital T indicates the period, right? And the period is the amount of time for one revolution or rotation. All right, so essentially the period is the amount of time it takes for one revolution. All right, so these two are uh, two of the main equations that we're going to use in this chapter. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so we have a simple problem here. It says the Top Gun pilot have, um, I'm sorry, Top Gun pilots have long worried about taking a turn too tightly as a pilot's body undergoes centripetal acceleration, right, towards the center. With the head toward the center of curvature, the blood pressure in the brain decreases, leading to a loss of brain function. There are several warning signs. When the centripetal acceleration is 2 or 3G, the, the pilot feels heavy. Right? And you feel the same thing when you're going on a roller coaster. When you get down to the bottom of a hill and you start to come back up, you feel heavier. Right? So that's the G-force increasing. It says at about 4G, the pilot's vision switches to black and white and narrows to tunnel vision. If that acceleration is sustained or increased, vision ceases, and soon after, the pilot is unconscious, a condition known as G-lock for G-induced loss of consciousness. What is the ma So they're asking, what is the magnitude of the acceleration in G units? So essentially how many Gs, and remember G is just 9.8 meters per second squared, of a pilot whose aircraft enters a horizontal circular turn with the velocity of this, which is 400 in the I direction and 500 in the J direction, and then 24 seconds later, leaves the turn with a velocity of negative 400 and negative 500 meters per second. 
Right, so essentially what, it, what is happening is it's going into a turn like this. So at this point, it enters the turn at some velocity, which is you know positive 400, positive 500, so some, something in this direction. And then it comes back and leaves the turn right at that point and with the opposite velocity. Okay, so it's essentially it's going through half of a turn. And the radius of the curve, if I did that a little better, it would be more like this. The radius of the curve is right here right so this is our radius okay so we're trying to find the magnitude of the acceleration um, so we first assume that the turn is made with uniform circular motion and that the pilot's acceleration is going to be centripetal acceleration right it's given which means it's going at the center of the circle right? its velocity is going to be constant and he has a centripetal acceleration given by the equation we saw previously also, the time required to complete a full circle is uh, sorry a full circle is given by the period, right? Which is essentially just rearranging the second equation, right? If we go back, we can see that it's just this equation rearranged. Okay, so we have that. So let's look at what the velocity is. Right, it's given in unit vector notation. Um, but we're assuming that the velocity, uh, the value, the magnitude of the velocity does not change throughout the circular motion. So if it starts with some magnitude, it's going to continue with some magnitude all the way through its curve. Um, so the magnitude of the velocity is simply going to be the square root of the components. So 400 squared plus oops, 500 squared. All right, and then we take the square root of that. What we end up with is 640.3 meters per second. Okay, so that's what our velocity is. Um, because we don't know what the radius is, R, uh, let's solve for the radius from the period equation. All right, so we're going to take this equation here, which was given earlier, and we're going to solve for R. All right, so when we do that, R is going to be equal to TV divided by Two pi. So that's the period times the linear velocity, or sometimes we call that the tangential velocity, um, and divided by two pi. Okay. So the period. Well, let's look here. It says that 24 seconds later it leaves the turn with a velocity of this. So essentially, it only went through half of a turn. So if the if the time it takes for half of a turn is 24 seconds, that means the period. It kind of explains it down here. Uh, but it means that the period is going to be 48 seconds. All right, so we have r is equal to tv squared over 2 pi. We're going to use 48 seconds for our period. Our velocity is going to be what we calculated, so that's 640.3 meters per second. And we're going to divide that by 2 pi. Okay. When we calculate this out, we realize that we end up with a radius of 4891 meters, so 4891 meters. Okay, so it says the speed here is the constant magnitude of the velocity during the turning. Okay, so we found what our radius is, we found what our velocity is, now we can go ahead and solve for what the acceleration is. Okay, so the acceleration is just going to be v squared over r. So that's going to be 640.3 squared divided by the radius, which is 4891 meters. And the value that we get is 83 meters per second squared. But it asks us to find the acceleration in g units, if you remember. So we want to just divide this by 9.8, right, because a g is 9.8. So we'll take this 83 meters per second squared divided by 9.8 meters per second squared per g, essentially. And what we get is 8.6 g's. All right, so if the pilot entered this turn, he would be experiencing 8.6 g's. And that's something that he might be able to experience for a very short period of time, but the longer you're subjected to high g forces, the worse it's going to be, right? The greater the chance of blacking out will be. All right, so continuing on uh, with uniform circular motion says, a body moving with a speed v in uniform circular motion feels a centripetal acceleration 
directed toward the center of the circle. A couple examples are, so when a car moves in, circular, in a circular arc, it has an acceleration that is directed towards the center of the circle. In this case, it's going to be the, fr the frictional force on the tires from the road that provides this centripetal force. So if you think about it, you have a car going down the road and you're making a turn. When you're in the middle of this turn, what lets you make that turn is the friction force between the tires and, and, and the road. Um, and because you're in circular motion, you need to have a centripetal force that's keeping you there. So that is actually the frictional force. Right? This is going to be the force of friction, right? Because your acceleration is in towards the center of the circle. So that's also the direction of the frictional force. All right, so in a space shuttle um, around the Earth, right? Both the rider and the shuttle are in uniform circular motion and have accelerations directed towards the center of the circle. So in this case, the centripetal force is going to be caused by the gravitational pull of the Earth. Um, so the centripetal force can really be anything. It can be a tension force if you're talking about a string that's holding something in circular motion. Uh, it can be the frictional force. It can be gravitational force. It can be a normal force. Right? If you think about um, there's a carnival ride where it's kind of a big circular uh, cylinder almost and it kind of has walls around it. And you're sort of standing up against these walls. Um, as this is spinning around, uh, what is keeping you in circular motion essentially it's pushing you inwards is going to be the normal force of the wall pushing on pushing on your back right it's easy to mistake that there is some kind of force pushing you outward because that's kind of what you feel like and since you're, if you're like in the in the rotating frame you feel like something is pushing you against the wall but what it actually is is the wall pushing you in in circular motion right because what you want to do is not go outwards but to go tangent to the circle Right, that would be tangent. This is the direction of your velocity at any given point. So if you know if the wall were to somehow go move away or, or break off or something, you would go in that direction. Right, you would go in the direction that you're currently going. You would not fly straight outwards. Okay, moving on. All right, so they also give another example of a hockey puck. Um, an overhead view of a hockey puck moving with a constant speed v in a circular path of radius r on a horizontal frictionless surface. The centripetal force on the puck is T, the pull from the string, um, directed inward along the radial axis R. Right. So if we had a string that was uh, held here in the center and it was pulling the puck around, our centripetal force in this case would be tension. Right. And as it's, as it's showing you here, the velocity is tangent to the circle. Okay, so now let's talk about the centripetal force. A uh, centripetal force accelerates a body by changing the direction of the body's velocity without changing the body's speed. All right, so again, you're changing the velocity, which means you're changing the direction, but you're not changing the actual speed, all right, which is the tangential or linear speed. All right, it's given by this equation, and this is simply derived from F is equal to MA. C, right, where AC was our centripetal acceleration. We should probably put a C here too, which means centripetal force. All right, so our centripetal force is mass times the centripetal acceleration, or simply mass times V squared over R. Uh, since the speed V here is constant, the magnitudes of the acceleration and the force are also constant. Right, so you have a constant force, constant acceleration, constant, uh, or at least the magnitudes at least are constant for the velocity. Okay. Let's go ahead and do an example problem. So it says in 1901, circus performance, Allo uh, Daredevil uh, Diavolo introduced the stunt riding of a bicycle in a loop-the-loop. -loop. Assuming that the loop is a circle with a radius of r is equal to 2.7 meters, right, so our radius of the circle is 2.7 meters, what is the least speed v that Diavolo and his bicycle could have at the top of the loop to remain in contact with it there? Okay, so essentially what we're trying to find is the his velocity at the very top point, right up here. What must his speed need to be so that he stays in circular motion? All right, well, so it says it's, we can assume that Diavolo and his bicycle travel through the top of the loop as a single part uh, particle in uniform circular motion, right? So to solve this, we're going to use uniform circular motion. And thus at the top, the acceleration of this particle must have the magnitude of this. Right, which is the centripetal acceleration. 
and this acceleration must be directed downward towards the center of the loop. Since, so since we're trying to find the, essentially the minimum speed that he still stays on the loop, we can look at our free body diagram and, and, and first look at all the forces that are acting on it. All right, so we have our, the normal force is going down, right, because the surface is actually pushing down on him. Um, the force of gravity, of course, is downward and his acceleration is downward, right? When he's at the top of the loop, his centripetal acceleration is towards the center of the circle, right? Which would also be straight down. All right, so we could write the equations um, for a centripetal force here. Um, what we want to first look at is Newton's second law, right? That relates all of these forces together. Remember, this is the uh, summation of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. When we do that, we see that we have a negative normal force, right, keeping down negative and up positive. We have a negative force of gravity, so that's minus mg, and those are the only, only two forces acting on it. And that's going to be equal to the mass times a negative acceleration, right, because we said the acceleration is also down, so we have to call it negative in our equation. But when we're when we're doing this we're trying to essentially find the least amount of speed so at the least amount of speed he's barely grazing the um the loop the loop here so we want this normal force to go to zero right so essentially you're matching his force due to gravity when you do this all right so taking this um also this acceleration is centripetal acceleration right that's the acceleration that's keeping him in circular motion so we got rid of the normal force and we have a negative v squared over r for this centripetal acceleration. All right, so now you can see that this simplifies nicely. The masses are going to cancel out. The negative sign is going to cancel out. We, we're left with g is equal to v squared over r and we're solving for v. All right, so our velocity is going to be, whoops, let's go back there. Our velocity is going to be uh, the square root of g times r, right? Uh, 9.8 meters per second squared times the radius r. All right, so taking this down here, we're going to plug in our values. So our velocity is going to be the square root of 9.8 times 2.7 meters, which is our radius. We get a velocity of 5.1 meters per second. Okay, so he needs to at least be going 5.1 meters per second for him to stay in circular motion around this loop. Now, of course, he could he could be going faster, right? He could be going faster, um, and he would also stay in the loop. But this is the minimum amount of speed that he needs. Okay, so we have one more example. Okay, in this example, we're looking at a a race car that's going around a track and going around a curve in the track. So it says. This figure represents a Grand Prix race car of mass 600 kilograms. All right, so mass is 600. As it travels on a flat track in a circular arc of radius 100 meters. All right, so our radius is going to be 100 meters there. Because of the shape of the car and the wings on it, the air, uh, the passing air exerts a negative lift force downward on the car. All right, so you have a, a force that's pushing downward on the car because of the wings. Um, the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the track is 0.75, so assume that the forces on the four tires are identical. All right, so what we're trying to find here is we're trying to find what the uh, what that lift force is, right? What FL uh, is what they're calling it is, uh, pushing down on the car. Okay, so we're going to first look at um, some radio calculations. Right? The frictional force is shown in the free body diagram, as you can see here. So let's take a look at our free body diagram. And they kind of show you it here in a way so you can kind of get a sense for it as you're going around the curve. Right, The frictional force is what's keeping you in circular motion. So that's going to be towards the center of the circle. right? And your velocity is going to be in this direction, right, tangent to the circle. So if you're looking at the car, they're showing this is like looking at the back of the car. If you're looking basically at its taillights, to the left, you're going to have the frictional force, right? That's pushing left, which means your acceleration is also to the left. Upward, you have the normal force, right? Pulling up, or, um, which is the ground pushing up on the car. Downward, you have this negative lift force, and of course, you have the force of gravity. So the first thing they do um, is, is they say that, you know, looking at this free body diagram here, 
Uh, and we want to do a Newton's second law equation, right? F net is equal to MR and just look in the radial direction. All right, so when we do that, we have an, a frictional force that's to the left, so that's negative FS. That's going to be equal to mass times acceleration. Well, this acceleration again is our centripetal acceleration. So we can use our equation for centripetal, or yeah, our, our uh, expression for centripetal acceleration. So this is going to be minus v squared over r. And again, I said minus because it's to the left. We're calling everything to the left negative, right? Because we call the force to the left negative. All right. So the negative signs, of course, are going to cancel out here. And what we're left with is mu s times the normal force, right, which is our frictional force, is equal to m v squared over r. All right, so now we need to figure out what the normal force is. Well, if I now do is a summation of forces in the y direction, right, so a summation of forces in the y, uh, I know it's not accelerating, so this term just goes to zero. I get upwards, I get the normal force up, and then I have the lift force and the force of gravity downwards. So this is, oops, this is minus uh, the, the uh, lift force minus the force of gravity, so minus mg, and that's going to be equal to zero. All right, just rearrange this for the normal force, and I get mg plus the lift force. Now I can take this and plug it into my equation here, so I get mu s is equal to mg plus the lift force, and that's equal to the mass times velocity squared over r. Okay, well I'm looking for this lift force, and I pretty much know everything else here, so I'm going to take this equation and just rearrange it and solve for the, uh, for the lifting force. When I do that, I get FL is equal to mv squared over mu s r minus mg. Okay. Now I can just plug in all of my values. All right. So there's an m in both of these terms, so I'm going to just factor that out. So this is going to be 600 kilograms times our velocity squared. Our velocity is 28.6 meters per second. So we square that. Uh, then I'm going to divide by the coefficient of friction, which is 0.75, radius, which is 100, and I'm going to subtract gravity off, 9.8 meters per second squared. When I go ahead and plug everything back in and use the, uh, excuse me, when I um, plug this into my calculator and get a value, I get 660 newtons for that lifting force. Okay. All right, well, that's it for this uh, lecture. The next ones will be um, moving right into Chapter 10's lectures on rotation.